I was thinking, you know, it'd be kind of funny to have a YouTube channel called The Cardassian Way, uh, and it would be sponsored by Gold Ducat. And then I went to look to just refresh my memory on um, what Cardassians are like, and I found an actual video better than I could have ever made talking about, uh, about Cardassia. Right on YouTube. I just did my search, and there it was. A fantastic video, awesome, awesomely put together, professional, incredible. So, um, uh, it, it shows that in Star Trek Deep, Deep Space Nine, the Cardassians are, um, take humans today and put Cardassian makeup on and Cardassian costumes on and you might as well have Cardassia right here on planet Earth. I just watched the video and Cardassia is identical in organization to the way we're organized on planet Earth with the government um, ruling the people and the military um, on, uh, they're supposed to report to civilian leadership. However, what they said in the video is uh, on paper, the military reports to the civilian leadership, but in actuality, they don't. The military is independent of the uh, government. So you got a government and you have military, two branches, two main branches of the, of the military. And so it would seem that you have three uh, um, uh, if you're a Cardassian, you got three uh, things you got to watch out for. You got to watch out for the two branches of the military and you got to watch out for the government. You got three masters if you're a Cardassian. Is it the same here? Um, we have a multiplicity of governments that have got Byzantine regulations and uh, high taxes and unbelievably shitty services and, shitty, and, and services that were claimed to be part of the national character. For example, Canada was always famous, uh, politicians always said, in the 1980s, we want to keep Canada's social safety net so that uh, the poorest of the poor don't fall through the cracks and become homeless and starving on the streets. And yet today in Canada, that's exactly what we have. Homeless and starving in the streets. Just as we have in the USA. So, um... Uh, the military in Canada is not a significant force as it is in the USA. In the USA, there's many military bases around the USA where one can be employed as a soldier or a technical consultant, uh, civilians. We saw Danny DeVito be a teacher for hire. But in Canada, we don't have these military bases, generally speaking, near uh, major cities. And the military is a very small number of people, a small percentage of the population compared to the USA, a vast difference in the countries. So the Canadian military is not seen as a, an authority figure in Canada. If, if you ask an average Canadian what they think about the Canadian military, they say uh, perennially, um, 50 years behind current technology. 50 years behind. 50 years behind current technology. Current acknowledged technology. As far as advanced technologies, you know, uh, that are suppressed, uh, we don't think Canada has any uh, advanced technical abilities in military whatsoever. In fact, we consider... Uh, um, Canada to be wide open for being conquered. It's a wonder it's not. It's a wonder it has no military. And compared to the militaries of... I would say that the Australian military is... For a country of a similar size, the Australian military, I would say, is way more up-to-date. They're way more up-to-date in their Navy and their submarines. 
Last time Canadians bought uh, submarines, they were used old submarines that they bought from Great Britain. And one of the submarines, um, submarines um, uh, caught on fire on its voyage from Great Britain over to Canada. So Canadian uh, Navy vessels are obsolete. So there's no one defending Canada. In the past, uh, there were agreements between the United States and America for America to defend uh, Canada from the Russians. Um, well, what we've seen is uh, Canada owned by foreigners, let's just say. The 1% owned the large corporations and... I don't know. The 1% owns Canada. Why does it? Because the 1% owns all countries, even China. So these countries that we say we belong to are sham. They're a total sham. Forever, we have been secretly ruled by the 1%. 1% uh, creates countries and they have these countries fight one another. Supposed to be different ideologies, and in the end, when you look at them all, it's all the 1% having phony baloney state-sponsored wars to kill people and intend people great harm. Uh, so creating a fictitious enemy, a foreign enemy, rather than realizing that the 1% that control all the um, worlds are the actual enemy. Uh, okay, switching gears... With Cardassia, so we said uh, a tight hold by the state on the the lives of the citizens, the people. Uh, the state of Cardassia said uh, in the video that they require every Cardassian to have a rear molar removed and sent in to a government office so it can be cataloged and kept as um, uh, the state having a sample of you and Cardassians are expected to comply. Other things um, that we were talking about um, that are not just Cardassian but very human are, uh, I just wrote down, things apparently solid have unexpected failures. So I have two examples for you, two engineering failures. Uh, when I, many years ago I worked in hotels in Whistler, British Columbia, Canada, and after one snowfall at a building there called the, I can't tell you the name of the building, at the Greystone. Uh, the Greystone building, one of the balconies let go of its attachments to the Greystone building and it fell to the balcony below. Clearly the engineering of the Greystone building, I'm sorry if you own that building. Clearly the engineering in Whistler is shoddy. I was a hotel manager in Le Chamois Hotel at the base of Black Home Mountain, a very prestigious location. And uh, there was discussion about that Chamois building, exceptionally ex expensive condominium hotel, condominiums, uh, luxury suites. But uh, the word on the street was the building itself was uh, prone to the same problems that Vancouver had during those days. And that was what was called leaky condos condominiums that were shoddy and not built to um, not built for the climate that they were being used in Vancouver they were building flat roofed condominiums uh, engineering kind of things used in Southern California where it's always dry and Vancouver exceptionally wet climate in the winter exceptionally wet rainforest 
temperate rainforest. So a flat roof building caused uh, exceptional amounts of leaks, vast amounts of water in the winter, and the buildings leaked, and the water got inside, and then it rotted on the inside, rotted the wood, and mold and mildew growth, and the buildings had to be ripped apart and uh, rebuilt at the, at, at the cost of the owner of the building and not the builder of the building. Enormous problem in Le Chemois Hotel. We talked to people who had worked in the building. We said, hey, they told us that Le Chemois Hotel and the, the hotel condos in Whistler, British Columbia were built shoddy and quick with unprofessional people, non-certified uh, non tradespeople. And, uh, well, we, we were just told that, you know, what you're buying is... It's going to cost you a lot of money. You buy, and I don't think the average person, investor that would come in there would realize, you know, they just see these things and it looks pretty, but behind the glitz and the glamour on the outside is a lot of structural problems and these buildings in places like Whistler. So you buy this thing, you spend a fortune, and then you know you get into it, and then you discover you get a report from the, the strata council of your building that the building is in major deficiencies, structural deficiencies, and needing enormous sums of money from you as an owner to rebuild the building that you must have been given to thought was a solid, well, well-run, investable property. So that's one example. The other example was um, in Ontario, Canada, where there was a shopping mall that had an elevated parkade, a parkade multi-level, and the, one of the levels of the parkade collapsed. The concrete collapsed because of what, they, what we would say in Canada is, well, the cars use salt on the roads, the cars get salt on them, and then they go and they go in your parkade, and the snow melts and the salt gets onto the concrete and then the, the wet water brings the salt into all the nooks and crannies in the concrete structure. The salt and the water get into the rebar in the concrete and then it rots away. And over the course of 25 years, the building becomes structurally unsound and it collapsed. This particular uh, shopping mall had changed hands and there was an engineering report on the building and on the parkade that said it was an okay, it was okay. And when, after the parkade collapsed, that engineer was brought to trial and anybody looking at it would say a professional engineer who charged money to inspect and produce an engineering report, a professional engineer, um, clearly lied about what was going on with the building and it cost I don't know if people died in that disaster or not so I'll leave it at that and well what, what would you say what would you say well what happened to the engineer he was not convicted so anybody like me an intelligent person will look at that and say that's a corrupt court you can come to no other conclusion that that court is a corrupt court by letting somebody off on that particular issue so what does it tell us? Uh, well, a lack of professionalism, a lack of holding people to the standards of the professional engineers. It seems to me, I, I just feel like people of my generation don't give a shit. And I used to think people of my parents' generation, those would be people in the, their 80s, I used to think that they did give a shit and they felt like engineering safety and inspections were something that were no joke and they had to be done seriously. But uh, that was the cover story and it's the cover story today. Underneath the cover story in those days, unbelievable, horrifically shitty design which carries back for a hundred years. All the workmen's compensation boards in Canada and the United States created because uh, employers had so many dangerous things going on in their workplaces that they didn't want to be openly sued. They wanted to create a great pooled thing so that when these things happened that they wouldn't have to shoulder the burden of being um, 
culpable for workplace deaths and uh, dismemberments. And I worked in some of these uh, a paper mill where safety for the human operators didn't seem to be built into the paper mill. Even though it was engineered by professional engineers, there were some dangerous places. One of my friends uh, uh, fell into, almost fell and grabbed a, a rail, a safety rail that wasn't all the way around uh, a pit where if you fell in, you would instantly die. It was slippery around the area, and the area wasn't the area wasn't fenced properly. And uh, the person luckily grabbed onto one one grab rail. It wasn't really grab rail, but a small fence that wasn't all the way. Grabbed that, and then somebody else pulled this guy out. Just unbelievable lucky, but could have been the end of the life of a nineteen-year-old friend of mine. Well, let's talk about it. The operators of that mill were union men, and they were there for 15 to 20 years. And for 15 to 20 years, there's clear and present danger of an unfenced, exceptionally dangerous area open to slip and fall and falling in. If you're in the paper mill in Thunder Bay, it's called the beater. Where it's a, a re-pulping re, uh, of newsprint that uh, wasn't a good enough quality. You had to go back in the system to get redone. But enormous blades spinning around uh, of hot, hot water and newspaper pulp. And if you fell in there, you, you would you, the most horrific death. I couldn't think of a more horrific way to die. And here it is, an unfenced area for 15, 20 years. And those union operators are intelligent men and nobody complained and said, because in Ontario in those days you had the right to refuse unsafe work. And en masse, those union people should have said, no one is going to work there until all of this is safe for humans. Instead, the union people who were there every day and the ones actually at risk never made an issue of this unfenced, unfenced area. And the engineering staff? who walked by it and who actually designed it. They did a shitty job, unprofessional, I would say. And there was plenty of operating uh, engineers at that plant who walked by it every day as well. And it never got fixed. Uh, so what, who are you going to blame on that? Everyone. Everyone gets the blame because every day that's a danger, a danger, a danger, day after day after day, and no one does anything about it. Cavalier attitude to safety. Not valuing human life. Not making human life Priority one. A lot of talk about safety is job one. But in actuality, it's just a story, isn't it? It is, because the union people uh, continue to do dangerous things, even when they're told a safe way to do that and told this is a dangerous thing. One thing was compressed air. Compressed air was around because it's a, you know, it's, it's used by tradespeople. And people were seen to be using uh, compressed air hoses to spray themselves to take like dust off or to, to just clean the dust off people who had been in a dusty area. And they were told that's exceptionally dangerous to spray compressed air on your body because it's very high pressure. It could take out an eye or God only knows what it could do. Anyways, people were told not to do it. It was a horrible safety hazard and you would be fired if you did it. And people continue to do this cavalier attitude towards their own personal safety. It seems people are absolutely insane. Doesn't it? To me, it seems like a lack of consciousness. And even when the consciousness, it's just like, who gives a damn? So, uh, I don't know how we get this, this Cardassian, but uh, maybe you need to watch some episodes of Deep Space Nine and see if we see this in Cardassia. 
the Cardassian people, you know, like Gold Dukat, are of fuck faced. <laughs> it's just the term I use for so many hum humans. Low in consciousness to the point of dumb. Just dumb. Dumb. Like, seriously dumb. Like, I can't get it. I can't teach you anything. You don't get it. I can take you and take you and talk to you and talk to you and talk to you. And you don't get it. It doesn't sink in when you need to know that don't use compressed air. It's dangerous. Well, that's for other people. But, you know, I know how to use it so undangerously. I'll just spray my boots or something. No one will see me. I know it's forbidden fruit. It's like, it's a safety hazard. Don't do it. And that be uh, it's taboo for certain people. I'll give you another example of the insanity of human beings in this vein. Uh, I met somebody from uh, Western Canada. I was at a French immersion in Quebec. And this was a young guy, uh, let's say about 20 years old. And he had, uh, he had something wrong with his eyes. They were like fixed and dilated. And he explained, well, he said, he said he went into a high voltage area owned by the hydro, the electrical, the electrical utility. He went to an area of high voltage and he climbed the fence and he went and climbed up into the electrical and he got electrocuted by high voltage and that the high voltage screwed up his eyes. Why the fuck did you do that, you moron? The beyond moron is is it's a cavalier. It's, I don't I can't understand why anybody would do that. So, anyways, um, I don't know. Let's say about a year later, uh, this guy sent me a letter, and he talked about his accident. The guy had gone back to one of these high voltage areas, climbed the fence again, went in there, and got electrocuted again. And this time, the electrocution was so bad he lost an arm. I was unbelievably sickened. I was sick to my stomach. I was just sick to my stomach. What can I say? Anyway, there are no words. There's no, that's all, moving along. So anything else we want to talk about? Uh, Cardassia and uh, the Cardassian way. Um, <clears throat> I think that's the final takeaway is that if you watch Star Trek, Star Trek was always supposed to be uh, putting humanity into another set of circumstances you know we put them in the future we put them in space but gene roddenberry the creator of star trek the original creator said what he wanted to do was show planet earth what they're like by showing these people in the future and showing you know the situations that they, they wanted to exhibit human behaviors and human human foibles to humans and not putting any pressure on them that it's actually them that are being shown on the TV or dressed up in makeup and costumes or whatever, but the relationships and the strange uh, scenarios that go on. 
And especially about what he wanted want to do in the uh, 1960s, in the time of great racial strife in the United States. He wanted to show a future, a bright future, where humans of every race work together on a ship. In the 1960s, racism was an unbelievable, horrific problem. And part of what Roddenberry wanted to do was to help educate people. To see, you know, it doesn't matter what species you are, behind whatever you look like in your physical form, you're a person inside, and everyone's a person inside. And what we see over and over again are, in Star Trek, that it doesn't matter what species you are, there's people that are in these meat suits. So people are people, people, and that's why we want to remind people that because we're expecting to meet these extraterrestrials, I mean, why, all those stars, and, you know, we're a very primitive race, what we're told. We expect these advanced races to come and meet us, and what we're told over and over again is if you want to meet the extraterrestrials, um, latest information is you need to get your vibration up. Because uh, uh, extraterrestrials, benevolent, extra, benevolent extraterrestrials are high, high vibration. And if you're at low vibration, it makes them sick. So they won't, that's why they won't come around low vibe people. Low vibe people. People who drink at the bar all the time and get stinky drunk and almost get run over by cars. Incredibly stupid people. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, you can try and figure it out. But, you know, from consciousness research... David R. Hawkins told us 540 unconditional love is where humans need to be, and it can be done. He said everybody on planet Earth can make 540 unconditional love. And, you know, the, the, I did a muscle test yesterday and said the collective of humanity, all, you know, the average human across the planet, 207. 207 is unbelievably long distance from 540. And 540 is something that we all do from time to time. Um, again and again, 540, the 500s are like uh, a kitten purring, how you feel when a kitten purrs, or when a dog is wagging its tail and smiling, just loving you. That's in the 500s on the scale of human consciousness, and that's where we expect humans to be. David R. Hawkins was a, a leading light of uh, consciousness research. And that's what he came up with. That's what he told us as, as a teacher is that's where you need to be. And when you get there, keep going. Don't stop at 540. Keep going up. It's unlimited how much more consciousness you can get. And he said, just get going. Higher and higher consciousness. Keep going. See what's there. See, these are states of mind. A person in the 500s sees the world differently than someone in the 200s. Internally, somebody could go and could be, in their teens, they could be at, let's go with 205. And if somebody, because they were born at 205 in the family they were born into, the parents were at 205. But as the person aged, and maybe they got in their 20s and they went off on their own, maybe they went to, maybe they went to a place like Sedona, Arizona. And they got involved with the granola people. And whatever happened after five years of being in Granolaville, you re retest the muscle testing and they go from 207 to um, um, 506. Enormous jump in consciousness possible for people to get in with the right people and people who practice uh, the spiritual teachings that they're taught. I don't know where you want to go with this one. I'm kind of at a standstill. Um, we did see in Star Trek uh, advanced beings who had advanced uh, values and advanced abilities. Uh, so the Organians um, in original Star Trek, oh, good God, I'm being blocked by these Cardassian reptilians that fuck with me all the time from giving you, from giving you all this information. Well, it, because the people who attack me act as if they are Cardassian. In fact, they told me earlier today that 
You might as well consider them Cardassian, and I'm considered Bajor, and Bajor in Deep Space Nine was conquered by Cardassian and occupied by a horrific, vicious, violent uh, race. And this sounds exactly what we think of the United States doing, building bases, military bases, all over planet Earth and enforcing their will by remote-controlled drone strikes, killing innocent civilians. Just last year, 2021, it was reported. Ten innocent people were killed by a drone strike, a drone strike by Americans. So, you know, the people who attack me uh, are evil. Are Cardassians evil? Uh, some of them. I don't think they're all. The tailor uh, that stays on Deep Space Nine, I wouldn't say he's evil. No, an uh, example of a, a very intelligent Cardassian, exceptionally intelligent, the tailor on board Deep Space Nine. Very intelligent. Cardassians are exceptionally intelligent in certain cases, and other times with Gold Ducat, they're exceptional uh, fuck ups, fuck faced. Gold Ducat, totally fuck faced. So if I've ever called you personally fuck faced, I'm calling you, you're identical in your ways of being and thinking and acting. You're identical to Gold Ducat. I've called a lot of people fuck faces. And I'm going to tell you, if you calibrate under 500, 500 is the level of uh, agape love. It's not relationship love like, I know I'm going to send you a valentine, then we're going to kiss or whatever. Higher love is love for life itself and you know, like environmentalism, animal welfare. You know, higher love for a civilization and the planet and life and uh, helping uh, beings live better more better lives so that is where the 500s are and that is above the 400s which is the level of the rational logical mind rational logical mind creates Cardassian um, victory someone said uh, yes the rational logical mind does not consider um, wisdom to be as important as the knowledge to build the things that are possible. If it's possible, build it. If you're in the 400s, and that's where you might have university professors of engineering, for example. In the 500s, the wisdom is more important than the knowledge of how to build something. The wisdom is overriding. Is it wise to build this thing? Yes or no? What's this thing going to be used for? Is it wise from, higher, from a, a perspective of love, agape love, is it wise to build this? Anyways, if you want more details, you need to get the book Transcending the Levels of Consciousness by David R. Hawkins. And if you want a little sample, go to Amazon, select ebook, and get the free sample for Kindle. For free. Go get a free sample of Transcending Levels of Consciousness. It's a, a, you get a good chunk of it, and uh, I can't make it any easier for you to learn about this, can I? So why is it that when I keep telling these things, a lot of people hear this and they don't go get the free sample? Why did you watch this video through and through if you won't take the simple matter of taking five minutes now and going and getting a free sample of Transcending the Levels of Consciousness by David R. Hawkins? If you don't do that right now, I'm going to call you a fuckface. 33 minutes in and you don't do that, five minutes, and I see it all the time, fuckfaceness. Gold to cat. You're gold to cat. Gold to cat is a classic fuckface, isn't he? And uh, I see nothing but fuckfaced humans. Fuckfaced. Because there are very few humans as high as the 500s on planet Earth. Wisdom people. Very few. Where our world is dominated by... Um, 
people at definitely under 200, the one percenters and the politicians under 200. So uh, we're dominated by people under 200, uh, under 190, under 180. 180 on the scale of human consciousness. Toxic people. Toxic people run planet Earth. 180, you go look it up on the scale of human consciousness. Everything under 200 is demonic. Ergo, the insanity we have, I gotta hang this goddamn thing everywhere and have one in every one of my fucking pockets. This fucking shit is 180. It is negative entities. Negative entities that are enforcing this through military and police power. Just like Cardassia. There's no wisdom in this. This is exceptionally vicious control by low vibe tribe. These guys. So, if you want to be a fuckface for the rest of your life, ignore what I told you. If you're going to be a wise person, and go and get that free sample of Transcending the Levels of Consciousness on Amazon for your Kindle. Free sample.